morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Invite you to open your Bible to Genesis. Genesis chapter 28. What I would like to say this morning is that God is here. And because God is here, this is a good place to be. God is here, and because God is here, this is a good place to be. Esau was after Jacob. Jacob had just cheated his brother out of the family fortune, and Esau was about to kill Jacob. Father threw him out of the house. He was alone, rejected, discouraged, a sinner. Genesis chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 184, the ladder represents what? Represents Jesus. What beautiful symbolism. Our verse says that one end of the ladder was on earth and the other end was in heaven. And the part on earth represents the humanity of Christ. Jesus is the link between earth and heaven because he came to live as a man. This is the human side of Jesus. But there is also a divine side And it is through this union of the divine and the human, the Jesus both of earth and of heaven, through this Jesus, there is a ladder by which heaven reaches down to us and we may reach up to heaven. Now, folks, there's no other way to get there. They tried it at the Tower of Babel to reach to heaven. And people have been trying by their own works to reach from earth to heaven ever since, and it has not ever been done. There is only one way, and that is to go by way of the ladder, Jesus Christ. Now, some of us wish that we could get to heaven, but wishing won't make it so. Only climbing the ladder makes it happen. They were working on a church steeple. They'd taken all the scaffolding down, put all their tools, all their equipment away. And the pastor and the head deacon stepped back and looked up to see the finished work. Everything looked great, except for one thing. There, way up high, there was one very large, very visible nail that stuck out. You could see it from 50 feet away. They just stood there and they looked at that nail. They talked about it, probably formed a committee. They looked away and when they looked again, it was still there. And they wished, they just desperately wished that that nail were pulled out. But they never wished strongly enough terribly inconvenient to have to get that ladder out again and climb all the way up there, but there was no other way out. And finally, they brought the ladder around and the nail came out. Talking about it didn't remove it. Wishing didn't make it so, but the ladder did. Sometimes we talk about being good. Some of us wish that we were good. Wishing won't make it so. Only the Lord Jesus Christ makes it so. 
There is only one way to heaven, and that, folks, is the ladder. But praise God, that ladder is here today. That ladder has been let down over the brink of heaven. And if you want to find your way to heaven today, the way is here. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, the ladder. Now back to the story of Jacob, verse 16 now of Genesis 28, verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Jacob came to a special place where something very special happened, and he sensed in a special way the presence of God. God does come in a special way to special places. And his church, this beautiful church dedicated to his worship, is one place where God likes especially to come. God is here. Amen. What difference does that make? I want to share with you this morning five differences that I think it makes. I believe that God is here in a special way today. First of all, because God is here, this is a holy place. Genesis chapter 28, and now the 17th verse, speaking of Jacob again, verse 17. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. It's a dreadful place where God is. Well, that's one of those places where the King James Version doesn't service quite so well. In today's language, it would be more accurate, perhaps, to say that he was awestruck. He was just overwhelmed by the fact that God was in this place. God's presence makes a place holy. We like to believe, we are right to believe, that as we come here to worship, it is in God's presence. But folks, it is a very awesome thing to come into the presence of God. And when we do, we know that we should be more reverent. We prove it from the fact that we expect our children to be. And we try and get the kids to behave in church and not whisper, but we do. It caused one little girl to turn to her mother and say, how old do I have to be before I can whisper in church? Every denomination forms, of course, certain traditions. Tradition among Adventists is to not show overwhelming respect for a place or for a thing. After all, the commandments, the word of God admonishes not to, you know, put our, our, our object of our worship, things that are made with man's hands and, and such as that. When we look at the commandments... And so sometimes we kind of belittle some groups that talk about a place being holy. And that's really unfortunate because too often I feel we don't show proper respect and reverence for a place of worship and thereby miss out on an overwhelmingly beautiful experience. Often in our churches, what is played as the introit when we come to start our worship, we Play the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. We acknowledge God's presence. Jacob believed that a place could be holy. He said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. God is in this place. And when you come to worship, will you remember that God is in this place? This is not a place for the mundane and the everyday. This is a place for God. With Jacob, let us proclaim, how awesome is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This church has the same problem so many churches have. 
how much I wish that we could enlarge the foyer space. We should be friendly and warm and talk to one another, and we could be warm and brotherly out there. But when we come into the sanctuary, let us remember God is in this place, and where God is, is holy. God is here. Because God is here, this is not only a holy place, this is a happy place. Please turn over with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 122. We're going to take a look now at a couple of the Psalms that talk about worship. Psalm 122 and verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. First of all, that word glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We have just said that this is a holy place where God is. But where God is, is also a happy place. And we ought not to teach our children to be so awed or so frightened by the presence of God that they cannot feel the thrill and the privilege and the joy of coming into God's house. I was glad, said the psalmist, when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Good news when you come to God's house, because God is here. God is good. And it is good to be in his presence. I have a friend who grew up in Washington State. And as a young man, his early high school years, he was too young really to get a regular summer job. But there were always jobs out on the Yakima Valley picking fruit. And he never liked that job very much. He said he wasn't very big. Those bags got really heavy, especially when they filled those large bags with pears and apples. And the leaves would get down his neck, and the ladders were hard to carry and maneuver around to get where you could pick all of the fruit off the trees. And he'd get one set up where he thought was just right to start up the tree, and then the ladder would start to fall over a little bit. And it was so hot, it was the middle of summer. But there was one thing that kept him going all day long knowing that at the end of the day, they would all throw those picker bags away as far as they could toss them, and they would make one beeline for the irrigation ditch. Refreshing, cool, clean. I think the week kind of goes like that, doesn't it? There are a lot of things throughout the week that aren't quite according to our choosing. But we can make it because we look forward to coming to God's house on Sabbath. Just like a good swim at the end of a hot day. As a matter of fact, my friend said sometimes it got so hot and they got so tired that they figured they needed a little time also in the middle of the day as well as at the end. And that happens to us spiritually. Sometimes we just don't hardly figure we can make it all week long. And so we have a thing called prayer meeting. We take a little refresher right in the middle of the week and we come to God's house. Because God is here, this is a happy place to come. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now let's notice verses 2 and 3. We're still in Psalm 122, now verses 2 and 3. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Because God is here, I would like to suggest that this is a place of fellowship. It's a holy place. It's a happy place. It ought to be a place of fellowship because God is here. 
Now, our verse talks about Jerusalem, about Jerusalem being a city that is very compact together. And it is, and it's always been that way. Back in David's day, the walled portion of the city was perhaps only about eight acres in size. Our church property is, I believe, four acres. So you can imagine that was the walled gates of the city of Jerusalem when David took over and made it his capital. It was expanded by Solomon. The city was expanded by Hezekiah and then later on by Nehemiah when they rebuilt the walls and then by Herod the Great when Rome occupied the land. But it's always remained a very tightly compacted city. And even today in much of Jerusalem, there is no space between most of the houses. They're very compact together. A pastor wrote about an experience that he had several years ago when he had the opportunity to travel to Israel as part of a Christian tour. I've always thought that would be a wonderful experience to be able to go and walk the Holy Land and see the places that Jesus walked and where he taught and where he healed. That would be an amazing experience. Well, during this tour, at one point in the tour, this pastor and several others in that group decided they wanted to go apart from the rest of the group a little bit of unscheduled time, and they wanted to walk on the famous walls of Jerusalem. There were about five of the men that kind of broke away from the rest of the party, and they didn't have any trouble at first. They went in through one of the regular gates of the city, and there was a stairway inside that they could make their way up. And the next thing you know, they were walking on the walls of Jerusalem. Those walls vary from 20 to 60 feet high throughout the city. And he said it was really interesting where they were because they looked out from the gates out to the surrounding countryside. It was very fortress-like. They felt like, you know, they were in a walled city. They were up high. They had this vantage point and like they could just glimpse of what it would be like if an invading army or something came in. Like they would have this position of being in a fortress. But then they looked back inward into the city as it was starting to get dark now. And there were taxis and neon lights and everybody dashing to and fro, right in the midst of two worlds, the old and the new. And they walked and they walked and they walked around the walls and the idea was to walk to a place where they could get back down through another gate. What they didn't realize was that at sunset they closed the gates. And they not only had their wish of walking on the wall, they were afraid for quite some time that they would have to find a place to sleep on the wall. They went by several gates. Everyone was locked. No way down. Or they would just have to get down some other way. Now, on the outside of the wall, it was a steep, long drop. But on the inside, there were houses built right up against the wall all the way around the city. Each house right up against the next one. And so they decided maybe they could jump down onto a roof of a house and maybe some way climb down between the houses and get down to the street, just kind of going between the houses and making their way down. But the houses were so close together, every house they looked at, so tight together, they couldn't even fit in between. Compact together, as the psalmist says, they couldn't get down. Finally, they went to one of the gates and they yelled as loud as they could until they got somebody's attention below. And eventually somebody came and showed them a way that they could, by climbing over a few select gates, make their way down. This is God's picture of Jerusalem. Unity, togetherness, compact. But there was another thing that they noticed about the houses along the walls of Jerusalem. Some were tall, some were very short. Some were wide, some were long. There were different sizes, colors, different styles from different eras. There were not two houses together that looked alike. You see, there was unity, but there was not uniformity. Now, folks, this is very important. Unity among God's people is a blessed experience. Unity, in fact, is essential if the church is going to prosper and grow. 
But uniformity should not be one of our goals. We don't have to be alike. We don't have to think alike. We don't have to dress alike or drive the same kind of car or like the same kind of music in church. We're all different. Some people who talk all the time about unity instead are really striving so hard for uniformity. Oh, I need to get everyone to like the things that I like in the way that I like them. They're not really after unity at all, only uniformity. In Jerusalem, our aim is unity without uniformity. Jerusalem means city of peace. We can all live peacefully together despite our differences. And you know, one reason we mustn't be uniform, it's because only when you learn how to get along with the people that are not like you, are you beginning to love the way Christ loves. Unity without uniformity. And so because God is here, because this is Jerusalem, the city of peace, this is a place of fellowship. Psalm 122 verses 6 to 9 kind of amplifies that. Psalm 122, beginning with verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Next, because God is here, this is a place of deliverance. Turn with me to Psalm 91. The 91st Psalm. (coughs) Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. And I want to pick out a couple of very special words for my last two points from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. The first word I wanted to emphasize was refuge. Because God is here, this is a place of refuge. Because the psalmist says that God provides a place of refuge. Do you remember in ancient Israel the cities of refuge that God established as the people began taking over the land of Canaan, the promised land? The scripture talks about it in Numbers 35. There were six cities of refuge designated by God and Israel, conveniently situated with three cities being on either side of the Jordan River. So you were never, wherever you lived in the land of Israel, you would never be that far away from a city of refuge. These are the cities to which the manslayer who had killed a person by accident might flee. The avenger of the blood of the one killed was allowed to kill the manslayer if he overtook him before he could reach a city of refuge. Now, can you imagine what that must have been like? When somebody had done some dastardly deed and somebody was after him, seeking revenge, running, panting, pell-mell, desperate, anxious, literally running for his life. He dare not stop to rest. And finally, he went in through the gates of the city of refuge. And he could finally breathe his first easy breath. Delivered. My friend, I don't know what's chasing you today. But you have come to the place of refuge. You may rest at ease here. Whether it's loneliness or discouragement or pain 
Or maybe it's a terrible sin that you haven't been able to get the victory over. Whatever it is, you have come to the place of refuge today. Nobody should have to go away from a church service and take a pill or a tranquilizer to get rest or relief from problems. You may rest assured because God is here. You have found peace. You have found refuge. You have found deliverance. The other word, again, from Psalm 91 and verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Now, refuge is nice. That denotes safety. Fortress is in some ways even better because this suggests strength. A fortress was a place where people were able to fight off the enemy. We come to God's house to receive God's strength, and we go from here through the indwelling power of Christ to fight the enemy, to be victorious through the power of Christ. Let me speak for just a moment about power. And when you go to purchase a vehicle, essentially you have three options to power it. Where's the power going to come from? First, traditionally, you go to the pump. You fill your tank with gas or maybe diesel. And then secondly, over recent years, especially many hybrid vehicles are available. A number in our church drive hybrid vehicles. A hybrid combines the best attributes of electric and gas-powered engines. An electric motor is used at lower speeds and for city traffic. At highway speeds, the gas engine takes over to provide the extra power that is needed. And while the gas engine is running, it's also recharging the batteries for the electric motor through a generator. And then thirdly, there are fully electric vehicles that are dependent solely on battery power. Of course, the problem traditionally has been that you have to have some type of recharging station at your home or somewhere we were on the road where you could plug in and recharge. And also the range tends to be limited. Certainly progress is being made, but typically only a few hundred miles you can go on a single charge. Many owners of electric vehicles will charge them daily. Now, how about the power that we need to be successful in life, to get us where we want to go? Our tendency is want to do it ourselves. We go as far as we can, running our lives, doing everything we want to do, independent of God. And we come to God only when we run out of power, when we're out of gas. And then we say, Lord, help me. But then, as we grow in our walk with God, we have more of a, I would call it a hybrid relationship. We still tend, unfortunately, to live our lives as independently as we can, all the while acknowledging that God is our source of power, but he's kind of our backup source of power, if you will. Here's where we need to be like a fully electric vehicle. There is nothing within you that can bring to your life the power needed to be successful in life. But that power is available. All you've got to do is reach out and plug in to the outside source. All the power of heaven is available to you. And remember that we also have very limited range. You need to plug in to the source of power every day. Amen. Yesterday's charge will not suffice for today. Today's power will not keep you through tomorrow. Plug in today to the source of power. Plug in every day to the source of power. Through Jesus, the connecting ladder our source of power. 
And so as we come together to worship, let us always remember that with God present here, this is a holy place. This is a place of worship. This is a happy place. I was glad when they said, let's go to God's house. It's a place of fellowship, of unity, of peace. It's also a place of strength, a refuge, and a fortress. It's a place of deliverance. It's a place of power. To God be the glory. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we serve such a glorious God. Amen. Such a wonderful, loving forgiving, gracious God. And Lord, today we give you all honor, praise, and glory for all the things that you have done. Lord, we're thankful that as we come into your house, that we can feel your presence, that you have promised to worship with us. And we thank you for joining us today as we have worshiped. We're glad when we can come into your house and worship you because you are a good God and you love us so. We're thankful that this place is a fortress, that it's a refuge, that we can leave all of our problems behind when we come into your house and know that you are with us. We can be reminded of your constant presence and your love for each one of us. Lord, I just pray that every day we will use that ladder Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. May each day bring us closer and closer to Jesus through the latter. May we become more and more like Jesus every day. Lord, bless this church. Bless each family in this church. Bless the individuals in this church. Bless our visitors today, Lord. Help us all to seek after Jesus, to want to become more and more like you each day through the latter, Jesus Christ, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.